Welcome to Kidney Health Interview. I'm your host, Natalia Karpenko. Each week, I interview a guest who a kidney patient, their family member, organ donor, or healthcare professional. Our goal to empower every kidney patient with the support and education. Join our podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Natalia with Renal Mate. Today in our studio, we have Erin Kabaluna. She's a renal dietitian. Also, she's an advocate for healthy, balanced lifestyle for kidney patients. And today we'll be speaking about Erin's journey as a renal dietitian and also about her journey as a dietitian for advocating for kidney uh, patients' diet, lifestyle, uh, mindset, and many more. So welcome, Erin. Great to have you on today's podcast. Thank you so much, Natalia. This is wonderful to be here. Uh, likewise, we're so excited uh, to have you finally invited to this podcast. Uh, so Erin, tell me more. Uh, what do you do? What's your occupation? Where are you based? And uh, what's your passion? Sure. Um, so I work at Satellite Healthcare in San Mateo. Um, it's the home dialysis uh, part of Satellite. Um, I've also worked at Wellbound of San Francisco and Wellbound of Daly City in the area, um, but I'm currently in San Mateo, and I'm the renal dietitian there. And uh, gosh, my passion is to, as our mission statement at Satellite is, is make life better for um, people who are on dialysis. So, yeah, I want to make sure they've got a good quality of life. <laughs> Yeah, it's so wonderful to have someone like you who's um, so passionate, so motivated. I'm sure p- patients in your unit incredibly happy to have you there. Um, I hope so. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure they are. So uh, tell me more about the additional involvements you have as National Kidney Foundation or any other organizations you've been involved as a volunteer, as an active member. Sure. So um, my husband, John Cabaluna, and I are very involved in National Kidney Foundation. We are volunteers. We actually just uh, volunteered at all three of the kidney walks here in the Bay Area, East Bay, Silicon Valley, and San Francisco. Um, And it is just so inspiring to do all of those walks. There's so many amazing people. So um, we're involved in that. We also participate in the Keep Healthy. um, uh, I'm blanking on the word right now, but the the Keep Healthy. um, uh, Oh my gosh, Natalia, forgive me. (laughs) It's um, the screening, sorry. Keep Healthy Screenings. and where we go into the community and we screen for protein in the urine, uh, blood pressure, and BMI through height and weight. Um, and we, we just, whatever else they need volunteering help with, we're just, we always try to be there for them. They're such a great community and a great team. Um, I actually also was involved in the Council on Renal Nutrition. Uh, I just finished up last year as being the uh, the, the chair, um, and that's been it's been wonderful being a part of that. I've been a part of it since 2012 when I got hired on at Satellite. So I kind of moved up through uh, the board, and it's been wonderful to meet other dietitians. Yeah. Amazing. So it's so nice to hear that you've been involved in so many projects and uh, uh, in the different stages of CKD, starting with uh, screening, um, detecting CKD in earlier stages in community, as well as uh, getting involved with uh, National Kidney Foundation and a part of renal nutrition, which tend to be so complicated. You know, when you speak to any renal patient, usually the biggest question is always how to manage my renal nutrition and how do you answer this question? Oh gosh, Um, (laughs) with with, with thought and care um, because the renal diet is one of the hardest diets to follow. It really is and I admire all of my patients who are following it and doing amazing. it's, it's a struggle. So I, I start off, I try to start off with the positives of this is what you can eat. Um, but we do, of course, have to talk about what, 
the patients have to limit now, which a lot of it is dairy products, nuts, all the things that for a normal healthy diet are very good. But these patients, they have to limit these items and cheese too. Cheese is another big one that the patients look at me and I think they're gonna throw me out of the room sometimes. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we have to talk about it because it actually really affects their bones. They contain phosphorus. And for you and me with our kidneys working, we can handle the phosphorus and keep our bones strong, but for them, it actually puts them at danger of having weak bones and hardening of their blood vessels. So, um, like I said, I have to approach it with care because it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it takes about probably 45 minutes to an hour uh, just to go over the diet with them when I sit down with new patients. Yeah, obviously, right? I can only imagine it's a... Um initial interview, initial conversation, but then your journey continues through the years and it's uh, just constantly learning and improving experience. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be really great to start from the beginning. Um, your inspiration becoming a renal dietitian or inspiration becoming dietitian and how have you selected the journey going to the renal space and nephrology? Sure. So actually i started out wanting to be a nurse um to be honest <laughs> uh, my mom had one of her best friends who was a nurse and i just thought she is the kindest sweetest caring person and it just made such a difference you know in everybody around her and i was like you know what that's what i want to do so i tried to get in nursing school but man 500 people applying for 100 spots it didn't work out too well so um, I went to my counselor and I was like, what do I do now? You know, I want to do something in the medical field, but I don't quite know where to go from here. And she asked me, well, what do you like to do? Well, being Italian and German, I like to eat and I like to cook. So she looked at me and said, you're going to be a dietitian. I'm like, a dia what -a? <laughs> I never even heard of that. You know, at like, what, 19, 20 years old? So um, yeah, I changed my major to nutritional science and it was amazing. I just, I fell in love with how food really truly affects all parts of our body. And it's just, it's amazing to me. It still amazes me this day. And I've what, been a dietitian since 2007. So yeah, I just, I got into it, changed my major, decided after I graduated from college, I wanted to get my master's degree because um, they have to do a dietetic internship to be able to sit for the registered dietitian exam. So I thought, all right, I'm going to, I'm just going to do it all. Let's just do it all. So I went into a 16 month program for dietetic internship and master's. And in Memphis, Tennessee, which the food there is delicious. If all of you all have, have a chance to go, you gotta go. <laughs> Corky's, Rendezvous, anyway. Um, so I, I got, you know, my, I did my master's and I sat for the registered dietitian exam. I passed, I got offered a job in Memphis and started my career at the hospital there. Um, but it's it's ironic because when I did the dietetic internship part for the um, you know renal disease and dialysis, I was really intimidated because there's so much um, involved. But now that I'm in kidney disease and you know dialysis, I can't imagine going anywhere else. Um, the community, the patients, and um, of course, part of my you ask about my inspiration. Well. My husband, John, he actually received a transplant from his uh, little sister. He was diagnosed when he was 25 um, with hypertension and his kidneys failed. He thought he had the flu, went to the hospital within 24 hours, had a catheter put in, and he was put on dialysis. So luckily for him, he was only on for about a year before his sister donated her um, kidney and they were a very close match. So he's been, let's see, he's had his kidney now for almost nine years. It'll be nine years in December. So just seeing how giving his sister was and how well he's doing, you know, after the transplant, he's already, he's ran 
two or three full marathons, supporting Team Kidney for National Kidney Foundation, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, so that's my inspiration. I'm so happy to be in dialysis and my journey took me here and it's just an amazing place to be. Erin, it's so inspirational. Thanks for sharing. Um, and uh, it uh, sounds like you and your husband are a power couple and uh, two of you are true fighters for kidney disease. So that's very admirable. Um, so uh, you mentioned that uh, your career and your education brought you to Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and you started your internship there. Uh, how did you end up in California? Well, my family actually lives in California. Uh, my parents and my two brothers live here. My sister lives in Chicago. So I moved, um, I actually drove across country to get to Memphis. It was a rocky start because I got into a really bad accident, but we made it there. <laughs> Everything was good. My dad was driving with me, so we made it there safely. Um, and uh, so I, I told my, my family, when I come home, I will drive across country because I need to make it. I'm a fighter. I have to follow through with things. And so, um, yeah, I, I did it. I did it. So I, I came back to California to be with my family. And my brother actually called me and he said, hey, my, uh, my housemate is moving out. He's like, I want you to move in with me. He's like, just come here. You have a place to live. You can find a job around here. So um, big Italian German family. You know, we all love each other. <laughs> That's really good, right? Support system needed for everyone. That is oh, a yeah. for success. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you return to your uh, supportive and loving family, and then you start looking for the job. Have you been recruited by satellite right away, or did you work in any other dialysis uh, companies before? Great question. So I actually um, got hired at Good Samaritan Hospital in San Jose because um, we were living in Santa Clara, California at the time. So um, I went to Good Samaritan, worked there for about three years and decided I needed a change. And one of my coworkers from Good Samaritan got hired on at Satellite, found out about the job in San Mateo, called me right away and said, hey, I think you would be perfect for this job. So um, I applied. And I went for an interview and right before Christmas, got the best Christmas present ever and was, you know, accepted as one of the dietitians for Satellite. Yeah, that's exciting. Very happy. Uh, yeah. Right. Career goal achieved just on Christmas time. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Satellite tends to be a very thoughtful organization about patients' uh, lifestyle taking a holistic approach besides a conventional approach to dialysis. Uh, so was it something like fully um, aligned with your mindset at that time or have the satellite introduced you some different way of care that eventually you adopted? That's a great question. I, I'm always into patients having a great lifestyle. Um, I love their mission of making lives better for patients on dialysis because dialysis isn't easy. Um, the patients come off, you know, the home hemo or the hemodialysis machines and they're tired, you know? Um, so I love their mission statements. Um, but it has changed how I've approached the patients, how I educate them, um, because a lot of the times it I wouldn't say it, 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 kind of, it takes patience to um, work with these, these patients um, because they, it's, it's a big lifestyle change and we have to have empathy for that lifestyle change. Um, even for you, know, you and I, any kind of change in our life, we have to really work at it and there's gonna be struggles and we'll have hiccups, but um, it really taught me to step back and try to put myself in their shoes and say, how can I make this diet a little bit easier to understand and more attainable, you know, like shopping at the grocery store, how to read food labels, um, looking at the salt contents. 
I mean, it's just simple things like that. I really had to step back and say, wow, like, this is what they're capable of. And so I need to work with that. And different socioeconomic backgrounds, that's another huge thing. Some patients can't afford fresh fruits and vegetables. So we have to teach them you can buy canned you know, goods, just rinse them off, get fresh water, you know, dialyze a potato <laughs> to get the potassium off. I mean, there's just a lot of techniques and tips and tricks that, you know, we have to think about when we educate them. Yeah. Um, so being very complicated diet, renal diet itself, and um, also, as you mentioned, patients have different socioeconomics, different culture, um, you know, preferences in cuisine, whether they're coming from Latin culture or Asian, African, um, right, uh, Afro-American or uh, German, Italian, right? There are so many backgrounds in California and across U.S. Mm -hmm. How do you see the culture um, impacts their diet? And do you see the tendency of certain nations maybe having higher chances managing their diet versus some other cultures tend to have really high phosphates and potassium food in their daily diet? Right, right. So, um, well, we'll start off with my husband's culture, which is the Filipino culture. Um, they use a lot of salt in their cooking uh, with, you know, the soy sauce and the vinegar to make that really yummy adobo. <laughs> It's delicious, but it's really high in salt. So luckily, um, with the help of my colleagues, we've been able to find some alternatives to alter recipes for them so that they could have healthier cuisine, right? Um, there's also the Tongans that have a very... Um, Oh, high potassium in their root vegetables that they like to eat. And so it's working on having them portion size so they can still have the food, but, you know, have a smaller portion of it. So they don't feel like they're being deprived of their, you know, their, their livelihood of eating these foods that remind them of home and, that so um yeah i i with, with with time and research um we've been able to help them adjust and just let them know what are the more appropriate foods and we actually do have a cultural uh diet book that council on renal nutrition came up with many many years ago and so we're able to give them the information from that book that outlines it and it's also in written in their native uh, language so they can understand that so we have like a mandarin cantonese um we have um i believe that there's a vietnamese and there's the filipino and tagalog so um that's really helped out um in in helping the, these patients from the cultural backgrounds that's wonderful yeah it seems like a very uh good support and advice for patients who just uh, really have so much joy uh, connecting with their culture through cuisine and being so far away from their motherland, giving them opportunity. Um, and it seems like you have a very personalized approach, giving them guidance, but then also spending time and learning what is important to them, um, right. and working on modifications. Uh, so what is your overall approach perspective on renal diet because there are different schools of thought in terms of goods and not good foods versus uh, balancing foods and try to create a balance or creating a personalized nutrition plan. Yeah, so um, it is very individualized. Uh, I think that's what makes it so important is looking at that person and the whole person and not having like a cookie cutter diet plan. We could totally do that. You know, everyone has to follow the exact same thing, eat the same thing every day. It gets really boring. Um, one of our, in, in our diet book that we give out, one of our nutrition tips, the very first nutrition tip that we have is eat a variety of food. and 
I think that's such a wonderful statement because that means and it's so true. There are a lot of foods that these, you know, dialysis patients still can eat. Um, when I was in the hospital educating the patients, I actually would joke with them just to kind of um, break the tension a little bit. And uh, I would say, well, all right, so you can have bread and air and a little bit of water. Mm-hmm. And they would be like, what? I'd be like, no, I'm totally kidding. And I'd, you know, give them the handout and we'd go over, you know, what are good, what's lower in phosphorus and what's lower in potassium. And, you know, it, it, it was just, it was nice to see the patients smile to say, oh, look at all these foods that we can eat. So, and now that I'm seeing these patients every single month, sometimes twice a month or even three times a month, um, I'm able to work with them on what are your favorite foods? What can we adjust? You know, bring me your favorite recipe and let me adjust it. Um, so the other thing is portion sizes, kind of like I mentioned before, where um, some of our Hispanic patients, they, you know, they've got their corn tortillas and they've got their beans and, you know, everyone loves the queso. And so what we try to do is say, if you're going to have the beans, just have a small little tablespoon of it. So you feel like you're still participating in your culture, but you know, you're not overdoing it with the phosphorus. So, um, and one of, one of my interview questions, um, when I first was being interviewed for the, this job is, um, my boss Faith asked me, well, can a patient have pizza? And I thought about it for a second and I said, well, I guess so. Yeah, because it's everything in moderation, right? So, I'm a little bit more strict with cheese nowadays. <laughs> um, and I think maybe I am because I myself um, in, we're up, I'm very lactose intolerant um, to the point where it causes me anxiety. Um, so I haven't had dairy products for about going on four years now. And I think it really helps me be empathetic when I tell them dairy products are one of the things that we need to limit, um, if not completely avoid, to keep your bones and blood vessels strong. And so that's kind of how I approach that. And I say, this is how I have modified my life. And trust me, I miss lasagna. I really do. I miss my mozzarella and my ricotta cheese. You know, it's it, it's hard, but I tell the patients, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And I am here to help you through it. And we're going to get you to be eating as much of those foods that you like to eat as, as you can. So, you know, that's, that, that's how I, I start. And, <laughs> and sometimes it works out really good. And other times the patients still struggle a little bit, but, you know, we all struggle a little bit, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think diet in general is always, um, uh, you know, daily effort and daily struggle for anyone, uh, Mm -hmm. whether managing our weight or, you know, managing our condition. And then on the top of this, having renal diet, uh, that's sometimes quite complicated. It just doesn't get easier. Uh, But you shared such a good tips already with us and something that many of our people in audience could just think about taking the recipes they like and see how those favorite foods could be modified to fit in this renal diet or maybe portion could be adjusted, uh, which is so brilliant. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to have those moments where uh, people have time to indulge their favorite snacks and foods. Uh, but also it's very empowering given people opportunity to say you have a choice and you know what to do because you got the knowledge behind. Uh, So it seems you're doing a fantastic job with that, allowing people just uh, to gain control back and just know the ways how they can manage it instead of have a strict restriction. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you mentioned cheese, and it's always such a big subject, uh, Mm -hmm. so many people, especially in European and American culture, I tend to be so used to cheese and dairy products because they've been, they've been raised uh, with those products from early childhood through entire life. 
Um, so what are your recommendations for maybe substitute? Um, are there any good alternatives? So it's just better to avoid any kind of things that look like dairy and taste like dairy. Well, um, luckily there have been some advancements of the almond milk and now there's like the coconut milk and they've had um, yogurts that patients could have. Um, but the key to my success with this is to find out how much phosphorus is still in them. And I've called for some of my patients and I I think, if I remember right, one of the almond yogurts still had 60 milligrams of phosphorus in it. So what I told, instead of instead of it being like 90 or you know 100 to 120 milligrams of phosphorus, so what we do is I tell the patients, well, here's the thing: is if you want to eat it, you still have to take your phosphorus binders. So you can still enjoy it, but just know that take, you know, maybe two Renvella pills um, because each Renvella can hold about 24 um, grams um, or sorry, 40, 46 grams of phosphorus. It can bind 46 grams of phosphorus milligrams. So um, it's, it's trying to help the patients know if you do these foods, you have to find out how many milligrams of phosphorus in them and take the appropriate phosphorus binders. So, and I kind of leave it up to them. And I say, if your lab numbers come back and your phosphorus is controlled, then we're doing a good job. But if your phosphorus level comes back high, then we might have to cut it out completely. So that's, again, it's very individualized. Each patient, um, one can maybe have a little bit more than another patient. So it, it's just very individualized. It's it's doing like a trial and error. And what I like to sell, tell the patient is like, let's do an experiment. Let's see if we can get away with this. <laughs> if we can, great. But we want to, you know, keep in mind that these recommendations for the renal diet are really for your ultimate health to keep you living longer and having a better quality of life. So, you know, we do what we can. <laughs> Yes, and I'm so glad that you brought uh, phosphorus management, uh, since phosphorus tend to be um, one of the most difficult and challenging micronutrients for patients to manage and spot on their, uh, you know, food labels because it's usually not listed there, as well as it's very often hidden. Um, so starting with the phosphor binders, uh, is there is a the best products that you recommend for patients or is it also trial and error you give them number of products and you see which product works better for them yeah um again it's individualized and some phosphorus binders work better for other patients um we as as a um an industry we've been kind of shying away from the calcium based binders um, because having high calcium levels in the body are also very dangerous for um, the bones and the hardening of the uh, blood vessels. So um, we, we've been you know, trying now these iron-based binders that are new within the last couple of years. Um, and the patients that I've been trying them out on are doing really well. Um, but of course, there's the binder that has iron that's absorbed, and then there's the chewable binder that um, doesn't absorb the iron, but it still does a great job of taking, I think, close to 100 milligrams of phosphorus with it. So it just depends on what the patient can tolerate. Um, I've had some patients take a binder and they have diarrhea. I have some patients take a binder and it causes severe constipation. And especially with those peritoneal dialysis patients, we really try to avoid constipation. So it's trial and error. It's which binder fits best for that patient um, and what they can tolerate. Some patients have problems chewing, so they can't do the chewables. Some patients have problems swallowing, so then we have powders that we can go to. So um, it's just... Yeah, it's, 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 I guess you could say trial and error and just very individualized for that particular patient. 
so the best case for patients really working with their, with their nutritionist and with their medical team to really find out the best binders. Exactly. And of course, I mean, it would be my ultimate dream to have patients not have to take binders by eating the very, very lowest phosphorus diets because they're taking so many other pills. We want to reduce that pill burden. So that's um, my boss, Gail Schulke, and I um, here at San Mateo. We're really focusing on trying to lower the amount of binders by changing stuff in the diet. So it's like our, our goal. <laughs> We're really working hard on that. Um, how about different modality of dialysis? Um, do they also help to manage phosphates? Um, yes, actually um, doing home hemodialysis uh, and especially nocturnal home hemodialysis, we've found that the longer the patient is um, getting dialyzed, you know, the blood's hitting the little dialyzer, um, that bigger phosphorus molecule is able to be taken out so and you know dialyzed out so we actually one of my home hemodialysis patients who does it at night the last few months we've shifted his prescription and he was having really high phosphorus levels and with a simple change of slowing down the blood flow rate so that it can go through the dialysis uh, the dialysis kidney you know slower his phosphorus levels are coming back beautiful in the, the fours, mid fours. So yeah, home hemo is wonderful. Um, and in center hemodialysis, I have seen um, improvements in phosphorus as well. Um, and, and peritoneal, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's because it's such a hard, it's such a um, large molecule that, you know, the potassium goes through just fine because it's small, but that phosphorus is still so big. So we have to give a little bit more phosphorus binders with the ones on peritoneal dialysis and focus on the low phosphorus diet, of course. Yeah, yeah. thanks for explaining that. So it just gets sometimes so complicated, just knowing all these modalities. And uh, so how do you see uh, in general, like success stories in um, phosphate uh, phosphorus management in renal patients' diet, since you probably have a lot of patients who are admitted to dialysis and they have pretty high numbers or numbers all over the place. And how do you, uh, how long does it take usually for someone who's in a high phosphorus to go back to normal? That's a great question. Um, again, it's very individualized. I have some patients who, once they get on dialysis and start a binder, it could be the next month that their level is completely controlled. Um, then I have other patients who, like for once, I have one patient who was constantly in the eights and nines, and it took a lot of convincing of talking about bone mineral management and what's going to happen to him and possibly having hardening of those renal arteries. So if he does get a transplant, if they can't connect those renal arteries, then the transplant's not going to work. So it took probably for him, I would say many, many months. Um, he was addicted to movies, like a lot of us are my husband and I included, that's like our guilty pleasure. Um, he loved getting popcorn and he was diabetic. So he drank the Diet Coke because they didn't have Diet Sprites. And um, Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper are all very high phosphorus or well, they're phosphorus containing sodas. It's the clear sodas um, that don't have any phosphorus in them. So, it took a lot of me convincing him that it would be better to maybe have some water instead of Coke when he goes to the movie theater. And when you get that popcorn, don't get it buttered, <laughs> you know, because, and, and get a smaller popcorn and share it with your family, you know, just so you have the taste of it, um, you know, but maybe take a binder, you know, so 
Um, it took a lot of months and now his phosphorus levels are absolutely perfect. They're also in the fours and low fives and every time we see him we're so proud of him. We give him lots of praise and it just makes him feel really good about that change, that really hard change that he did. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing how much we attach to our habits and um, those lifestyles that uh, comfort us and make us uh, you know, feel a certain way. But I always, when I hear a similar story, I just wish that patient trusted 100% and took that advice and ran with it for a couple of months. And then just look back and probably may build a bit different attitude about the advice. But um, it's way more complicated than that, right? <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of effort and I don't do it alone at my center. I am so blessed to have an amazing team of nurses and my clinic manager and my social worker. Um everyone talks to the patient. We all approach the patient and explain how important it is to follow the renal diet. So I am so lucky to have all of them supporting me in getting these patients to, you know, be healthier. <laughs> yeah, I'm so grateful to them. Yeah, that's so amazing to have a great team and good support that uh, uh, on one side also very inspiring even for patients coming to the unit or coming to their appointment and uh, getting that positive energy. So that's just making very different approach to dialysis when you have friends and peers versus just coming to clinic environment and just feeling tired of this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so yeah. <laughs> the question on this, how do you build culture that allows patients to feel more connected to uh, medical staff as well as kind of getting used to being on dialysis uh, for many, many years? Yeah, we, um, I think we, in San Mateo at least, and, and I know other, other clinics do the same, is we really just listen to the patients. We listen to how they're feeling, and we try to just let them talk, let them explain where they're at. Um, We've also had a new um, pr process where we talk about their goals and where do they see themselves and what are they living for. Um, one of my patients who's on home hemodialysis, she, her daughter just got engaged and she had a really, um, she had a medical scare and almost went off of dialysis. But because her family was so supportive, she's back on, she's doing wonderful, and is helping her daughter plan her wedding. So it's really, it's finding out what's important to that patient. And sometimes if I have to go in there and do some diet education, and they're having a really bad day because of whatever happens, there's no way my education is gonna get across to them. So I just let them talk. And whatever struggle that they're going with, I just listen. And after they've kind of gotten it off the, their chest, then I can go in and say, okay, here's what we need to talk about. But I think one of the important things is always focus on the positive, what the patient is doing right. Start off that way. And that kind of promotes um, happiness and joy and praise and makes them feel better that they're doing something really good. Um, and then I talk about, okay, so here's what we can improve on. So that's kind of, that's kind of how we, you know, we, we go about our letting the patients feel safe and welcome and, um, you know, if anything's bugging them, I like we all call on each other. So like if the patient's struggling with something financially or they're really concerned about their insurance, oh, I pull the social worker in and I, you know, say this person needs help and she does an amazing job. And helping that patient 
having them feel like we are listening to them, I think that really helps because, I don't know, I feel like I have, you know, almost 100 family members, not patients, but family members, you know? <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. Um, uh, so with the care of patients in dialysis unit, it seems uh, um, you yourself and your team accomplishing um, a lot and I'm sure it's only um, because you all constantly learning and always have this personal approach to every patient. Uh, but what happens when patients go home? Be when patients have certain diet preferences or certain lifestyle preferences are very often dictated by their family members, their caregivers. Uh, so what do you see common in patients who are doing well? Yeah. Um, it's, is you know we have um we have different home situations um throughout our our patients and the ones who do really well are the patients whose family members come in for the training from the very beginning everything from diet counseling to learning how doing the actual dialysis procedure and exit site care, um, how it's all done. The ones who have that really good support at home, they do the best. Um, not to say that the ones who don't have support at home, like either live alone or maybe have family members who don't quite understand, don't do well, um, but I really find that the ones whose family members we connect with, our staff connects with, um, they, they really thrive because maybe the patient doesn't cook, but their family member does. And if we can get the family member to maybe, you know, add a little bit less salt <laughs> in their, their food cooking, um, and, you know, how to choose the groceries or the, the food at the grocery store, you know, they they really thrive. They they do. Um, you know, I've got some patients who are really old, and their family members they put them on the machines. They take them off the machines. You know, they just make sure that they have everything they need. So um, we welcome any family member who wants to come in and learn to learn. Um, you know, whether it be diet. And sometimes I, I do have to call a family meeting so that the whole family understands um, the diet plan um, because there are some patients who like they'll go to parties with their family members. But the family members are like, oh, here's this great food. And the patient's like, oh, I can't have it. And so maybe the next time they go to that, that you know, the party, there's some food there that they, they can eat. They know what they, they can eat and the family members are really supportive. Excellent. Yeah, it's a good advice in terms of uh, how family members, um, if they want to help to their loved ones, they have to get involved earlier. Kidney diet requires to cook at home and otherwise it's so complicated to find in renal nutrition outside in the restaurants and um, almost impossible in any fast food places. Yes. So what, what is your advice usually for family members who cook and how they can incorporate renal, um, let's say, meals into their daily cooking or how they kind of substitute certain things to make a separate meals for the, one, uh, for the family members with a kidney disease? Sure. So, um, cooking is very important. Um, luckily, there are those uh, food uh, delivery um, um, programs where people can, you know, have fresh food delivered to their house and they can cook that for the patients who maybe can't always get out to the grocery store. Um, but ultimately, my motto is fresh is best. The fresher the food, the better. You're going to be avoiding any added salt, any, you know, high phosphorus foods or the phosphorus added foods. Um, and when you go grocery shopping, you shop the perimeter because that's where your fresh food is. So um, we, we also tell our patients, at least whoever is cooking at home, um, you know, there are 
there's salt-free substitutes, um, you know, like there's Trader Joe's 21 um, Season Salutes, which is really good. Um, there's Mrs. Dash, and luckily there's tons of different Mrs. Dash flavors. Of course, it's all pepper-based, so if you don't like pepper, well, you know, you can find other stuff like the powders. <laughs> um, always sticking with any seasoning that ends in powder is really good. Um, one of my other favorite things to point out to my patients is when you're using soy sauce, in three-fourths of a teaspoon of regular soy sauce, there's 250 milligrams of salt, right, or sodium. In a whole tablespoon of low-sodium soy sauce, there's 250 milligrams. So what's the better option, right? You go with the low sodium soy sauce, you can use more of it. It's great. <laughs> um, fresh, fresh, um, you know, like garlic and celery and using tomatoes and onions, all of that to create really aromatic, you know, flavors um, when you're cooking. It's, it just, it works. And I've, I've had patients who even after probably three weeks, they come back to me and say, you know, I've been not using salt and I went out to eat the other day and I ate something really salty and it was so overpowering with salt, I couldn't even eat it. And I'm like, yes, success. You know, <laughs> they've learned that they don't always need salt to flavor food. So it's just really working with them to give them their options. Um, and there's recipes. We actually have a recipe book um, that we gave out one Christmas to the patients. So the recipe book has different um, renal uh, recipes in there that are low sodium and a, a National Kidney Foundation, kidney.org has recipes on their website as well that the patients can, can go and, you know, look at. So it's really helpful. Yeah, fantastic. Such a good resources and such a good tips because, you know, not having a flavor in food, it's not really exciting. But when you're exploring that, there are so much other taste could be in food besides salt and it's, becoming more pronounced as soon as you put less salt, it's becoming even more interesting to start cooking and tasting the meals and having that indulgent flavor, you know, created by cooking at home. Right, right. And it's not to say that they can't ever have salt. It's just really cutting back. I mean, we, I do say the patient is okay to put a little bit of salt in while they're cooking because it goes over the whole entire meal. Just don't make it snow after you're, you know, when you're about to eat. <laughs> so. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, so Erin, today we have reviewed uh, so many fantastic advices for patients, how they can manage their micronutrients, how they can manage their support system, how to educate their support system at home to be more involved. And um, I really want to make sure in today's conversation, We'll talk a little bit more also about the journey as a renal dietitian um, and use certain journey of self-care because this job is incredibly demanding. Uh, so tell us how demanding it is and then tell us how do you do the self-care, the self-management uh, to be able to actually have so much positive energy as you do uh, to be there for patients when they need you. Sure, yeah. Um, it, it is demanding because, like I said, these patients, they not only are my patients, but they really become a family. I mean, I see them every single month and we really get to know them and their goals in life. And so it's like I, I want so badly <laughs> to make sure that I can do whatever it takes to make them get to those goals. So um, it's demanding in the sense that there's a lot of patients, they're all individualized, and it's a lot of education. It's a lot of sometimes repeating the same thing over and over and over again until it finally sinks into them. Um, it's emotional when the patient does achieve that you know, optimal goal, whether it be, you know, getting to their protein level or lowering their phosphorus or keeping their calcium level down. Um, it's, I think, I think those moments are what really keep me going. 
is when that patient achieves that level and they can they can feel really good about that change. So, um, you know, as for self-care to keep on going back every day, I mean, that's what motivates me to keep on going back every day is knowing that there are these little victories and, you know, celebrating with that, those victories, like I call it my dietitian happy dance. So when I come in the room and I got my happy dance, they know that something great has happened. Um, and, you know, for self-care, um, just trying to enjoy the weekends, <laughs> I guess. Um, you know, taking some vacations, just little breaks here and there. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the volunteering, it's the, you know, listening to the webinars, it's going to, you know, the spring clinical meetings and hearing new ideas from other people that's it's so motivating and you come back and you tell the patients about these new ideas and and they get excited about it and we see improved outcomes and they've got more energy one patient he was really struggling and he was able to go grocery shopping again he had the energy to drive to the grocery store and shop for the foods that he wanted to cook at home. I mean, that's huge. Like if, if that doesn't keep you going, I don't know what does, you know, these, these patients having improved lives, like that's, it's just, it's inspiring, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so beautiful. Thanks. Uh, uh, just your conversation itself is so inspiring. Just seeing how, much advocating you are for each of your patients. And I love that one, nutritionist happy dance. Yeah. <laughs> um, so do you do this one usually on the labs day or just depends, right? When the victory happens. Yeah, no, I mean, so when I, when I, you know, walk into the room and I give them their, you know, lab reports and I do, you know, smiley faces um, and I just kind of like, you know, shuffle into the room and, you know, I'm not a very good dancer, <laughs> but, but, you know, just something to make them smile and laugh and know that, you know, together we have achieved a goal and, it's just one step closer to them, you know, living a longer life um, on dialysis to spend time with their family and, um, you know, achieve what they want to achieve in life. Yeah. Yeah. You shared a very inspiring message and I'm sure any future or young dietitian is who listen into this podcast, uh, uh, they could be thrilled. Um, to be connected to you or also finding out a little bit more where they can find the right resources and um, renal dietitian community, how they can connect and get those ideas, inspirations. Uh, so what's your favorite few go-to events, meeting organizations you would recommend for young dietitians to get involved with? Sure. Uh, definitely um, get involved in the Council on Renal Nutrition. Um, it's the um, CRN NorCal, and they can find it on uh, the internet. And we have four meetings a year, so that's that's one um, go-to. Uh, the other one is National Kidney Foundation puts on their um, uh, symposium um, every, I think it's September, and so going to that um, would be really helpful. Uh, they also have their spring clinical meetings um, all throughout the US, which is kind of fun because you get to go to different cities. I, I just was in um, uh, Boston in May. My husband and I went to Boston in May because um, actually I got an award um, for being recognized regional uh, dietitian, renal dietitian for oh, region. Congrats. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that, that was humbling. Cause I'm like, I'm just doing my job and I love what I do. So to get an award for that's kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, so the national kidney foundation spring clinicals, um, there's another one and I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now, but, but just getting involved in that going on um, kidney.org and getting involved in any kind of volunteer, um, you know, uh, events that that's happening, going to the kidney walks, 
um, you know, at least for dialysis wise, you know, I know that there's so many other disease states out there where dietitians are definitely needed. So, but, um, you know, I'm a big fan of kidney and dialysis, so <laughs> I promote that mostly. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Um, Erin, it was so much joy and so much fun speaking with you today. Oh, and <laughs> I'm so appreciated that uh, you were able to find time in your very busy schedule to be on this podcast. And oh, my, my pleasure completely. <laughs> uh, so I'll keep you posted. Um, and thank you so much again. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. This was really wonderful.